Good evening, ladies and gentlemen of the Nexus. Welcome back to the Ace and Ektar Nexus Gaming Series, Heroes of the Storm Casting Podcast. I'm still Ektar, he's still Ace. And tonight, we've got a Division B East game for y'all. Yeah, we've got uh, Chaos of the Waking Dragon, who will be in blue today, and Region Phoenix in red. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to this match. Uh, we have experience with Region Phoenix, specifically. I don't know as much about Chaos of the Waking Dragon, although I believe we casted them earlier this season, or is that somebody else? Oh god, I hope not, because I don't remember doing that. No, no, no. It was, uh, it was a different team. Okay. It was definitely a different team. It was some other three-name team. They are definitely a new team for the season. Um... I maybe recognize one of the names, Silent Shoe. Silent Shoe, yeah. familiar, but I think all the rest of them are new to NGS for the first time, and that's always really exciting. Yeah, and, definitely. Uh, since I know, Ace, you've been here for all of 45 seconds, we're going to go over the draft real quick as we wait for a couple of the members of Regen to get uh, all settled, and then we'll get into the draft. We had the coin toss was won by Chaos of the Waking Dragon, and... They opted for first hero pick, so Regen had obviously by default been given the first map pick. They banned out Braxis, Chaos banned out Volskaya, Regen banned out Cursed, Chaos banned out BOE, and then Regen picked up Tomb of the Spider Queen, which is where we find ourselves right now going into game number one. Alrighty, thanks for catching me up, because I genuinely didn't know how we got here, even though it was game one. <laughs> Absolutely. So, yeah, taking a look, uh, Tomb of the Spider Queen, wave clear heavy. Uh, so, I'm curious, not, it, I guess not if we'll see mages, but how many mages get banned, or banned or picked, uh, how the teams choose to approach this map because it depends so much on the wave clear. We do see the extremely common Oriole first band coming out from Regen Phoenix. Oriole is I don't know Pretty if she, good. I don't know if her win rate warrants how often she's getting first band, but the perception is definitely there that she is definitely first pick first band worthy and we're seeing that come out here. ETC, the most common played tank for B East this season, I believe, and Johanna, you know, the next most common, and getting picked up immediately from the side of Chaos of the Waking Dragon. Yeah, I think ETC's overtaken Johanna this season because Johanna's actually started to draw bands due to how good she is. So, I mean, that's that kind of puts a testament to how important Johanna's wave clear ability is on practically any map that exists. And we actually have the soul lane band coming out, or the soul lane pickup coming out from Mudge with that Sonya, which I think is really interesting. The soul lane in the current state of the meta tends to be very kind of highly prioritized, and you like to, you see a lot of teams hold off on drafting their soul laner so they can try to get that advantage. And the soul lane can fill kind of a lot of secondary roles in your team comp, so going immediately into the Sonya is a big show of confidence coming up from Regen, saying that it doesn't matter who you draft, I'll at least go even with everybody, and to be fair with Sonya, I feel like that's pretty much true. Yeah, Mudge has taken Sonya before, I've seen some of the Regen Phoenix games, and they have a strong preference for Sonya, they think she can win win or tie basically every soul lane matchup, and Mudge plays her very well in the team fight. so a good pickup early for Regen Phoenix. And Stukov is a very good healer, um, especially what you can have the heavy team combos along with the uh, rooting silence at 13. And even besides that, he just is a ton of healing throughput, so Stukov is a very safe and also very powerful early healer pickup, which actually works fantastically with Kerrigan, because you root him in place and then they can't even try to escape with that silence. Yeah, you can't even dodge the combo. Real quick, I want to uh, bring back the stat that you recommended earlier. Ariel has played 8,300 games since the patch in Master and Diamond League and has a 60% win rate. Jeez, okay, definitely first pick, first ban worthy. On, yeah, yeah, that's a 31% uh, of all games. And there is a very traditional mage pickup, but we also have the increasingly popular main tank Uther coming out from the side of Chaos yeah. of the Waking Dragon. 
it is at least uh, double support. Bruisery? Yeah, it, it's Bruisery supporty. I will... I expect to see Varian run in the soul lane and Uther run... Actually, they have a main tank in Johanna, so... Yeah. It's a very, very heavy front line. Um, the captain of war control would be very pleased with this uh, comp coming up from the side of Chaos the Waking Dragon. But actually, Blaze getting picked up for the main tank role on the side of Regen Phoenix. Blaze, really strong in that. And especially with as grouped up as Chaos the Waking Dragon is going to be, you can get some huge value off of those uh, really big jet propulsions. Yeah, I've seen Arrow play a lot of Blaze for his team, so I'm not surprised to see it. It works out well, especially when you have as many frontliners as uh, Regent Phoenix does. You don't necessarily need the bulkiest or the most indestructible tank, because the damage can get a little bit more spread out, and especially with the Medivh support and the Stukov high heal amount, or burst heal with the bio kill switch, you can I think you can do it pretty effectively. So, do you have a team preference here, since we can't comment on Portrait Synergy, as both teams have got their act totally together, and are totally synergized? Well, I'll figure, I'll uh, get to that after we introduce the teams, uh, starting on the left side of the map, in the blue trunks. We do have Chaos of the Waking Dragon, We've got Silent Shoe playing Gul'dan, Sheath on Varian, Truffle Stuff on Lucio, Darth Uther being played, and Don Ron for Life on Johanna. And on the right-hand side, spawning in the right, the red trunks, we have Regen Phoenix with Rabid Penguin playing the Kerrigan, Area playing Stukov, Aero playing the Blaze. We have Mudge on the Sonya, and having to open up the menu to re refresh that it is Darabo on the Medivh, because you don't get the name when he's in bird form. That is true. That is true. So immediately, like. Four really interesting talents all coming out from the side of Chaos of the Waking Dragon. We have the Party Mix, which is going to give Lucio that extra range to keep him maybe just a little bit safer and probably warranted going up against a Kerrigan. We do have Uther with the auto attack quest, and we have the Pursuit of Flame coming out from Gul'dan. Yep. And even yeah, Sonya, not, or even Johanna deciding that she doesn't need the extra shielding to prevent the crowd control combos coming out from the side of Regen and going into the Laws of Hope instead. Yeah, and Varian goes with the High King's quest, so while it could be smashed, we could see the Twin Blades variant, which I actually think is pretty good here. Uther takes a lot of damage, gets followed up into the silence combo from Arya, and does escape with that double support life, but that is a lot of damage, and... Uh, a lot of rotational pressure being applied by Regen Phoenix as they use the Medivh portals to just rotate in between lanes almost instantly. And look how low Darth Uther's mana bar is already. Like, Uther doesn't... He doesn't do particularly well in the mana department to begin with, and he's already below half at the minute and a half mark. Well, yeah, he's got four auto attacks this entire game, the last three coming in the last couple seconds, and... Look at this, Aaron and Darabo are just harassing the rotations, and this is a great way to get ahead. This is a... You know, I was, I was interested by the Medivh, because it's a smaller map, but man, they are uh, using it for rotational efficiency right now. I mean, when Portal literally takes you from one lane to the next lane, it's getting a lot of value. And speaking of value, that's a value combo coming into Darth Uther, who takes a ton of damage, is... maybe... Not going to get out alive. Very close, but a clutch portal coming out from Darabo to secure that with the uh, the rift damage. Securing the first kill of the game. Checking the bottom lane for a sec, we can see that Sheath is having a really rough time against Mudge's Sonya. Uh, already down to below half. I think he already tapped once. I'm going to go ahead and check that. Uh, looks like... Yes. Yes, he had already tapped. And he pulls out a second sword, so we will see that twin blade. So I think that's a good option mainly because of the burst prevention that Regen Phoenix has, uh, is going to pretty much limit call smash comps or viability. So I think uh, Twin Blades is definitely the most reliable pickup here. And it it definitely is going to help him in the Solane as well, especially if he ends up going into, I believe... Uh... Oh, I don't remember Varian's talents. The one that second gives him... win? I think it's second yeah, win. second win. I want to say Victory Rush because that's an ability in a little Warcraft, but that's a different talent. Bit of a missed combo coming out from Rabbit Penguin, but doesn't actually lose anything for it other than offering up one stack to Gul'dan. 
Arrow goes in for a little bit of a charge, but doesn't actually find much purchase in it. Does end up popping that Pyromaniac so that they can reduce that damage just a little bit, and for the most part, everyone just kind of walks away. Yeah, there's a lot of posturing, a uh, little bit of adaptation from Chaos of the Waking Dragon to adapt to the aggression that Region Phoenix has been putting out so far. But there's only so much you can do with a uh, lane matchup or a four-man matchup that's just unfavored. So, yeah, you do see Darth Uther trying to uh, help out Varian in the bottom lane, at least top him up so he can get even on this level four talent tier. And uh, seems to be working well. Mudge is in a little bit of a bad spot, but a good flyover by Darabo is going to help him out. Yeah, now Sheath is actually a bit in a rough spot, but is going to be able to walk away. Should have tap up pretty soon. There it is. And uh, we're going to have to see Darth Uther probably get back into the four man rotation, so they're just going to start losing out even more in these rotations. Although we do only have Arrow and Darabo in the normal four man right now, so they are losing a little bit of map pressure as Gul'dan's wave player is just able to buy them so much room on the map. Yeah, if there's one criticism I have of Region Phoenix's comp, it's the fact that they do lack wave clear. They're making up for it in four-man rotational pressure, but they do not have the best wave clear, especially compared to H. Ohana Gul'dan. What they do have is web weavers descending as arrow and company were able to turn in. We do have the uh, second win, you are correct in that, so that should make the lane matchup a little bit better for Varian, as Sheath can just stand there and auto a little bit, as we do see him trading pretty decently now into Mudge, although we have a big engagement coming out, Darth Uther gets brought down below 50%, we do have a portal that doesn't look like it's going to end up actually doing anything, a little bit of a stun coming out onto Darabo, but a little bit of a, a little bit of damage taken on the side of Chaos of the Waking Dragon, and not really getting too much in return for it. Yeah, and a nice Jet Propulsion plus Stukov arm at the door is going to make it tough. Good carry and pullback is going to secure at least one kill. Uther goes down. Don Run is in a lot of trouble. Darbo's going to try and portal in. Does hit an Arcane Rift to keep it going. But the healing from Uther is going to keep him alive for just a little bit until uh, Arya and Arrow go through the portal and confirm another kill in probably this top four. Definitely the top fourth. The real question I have at this point is what do we see in the bottom lane as well? We do have the Web Weaver going down, but that's still a very big wave and a very aggressive and angry mudge on that Sonya. Seeing what they can get done, Sheath does try to go in for a bit of an engage, doesn't really find anything, but it does force Mudge back just a little bit, probably looking to either meet up with his team or take a mercenary camp as soon as the Web Weavers are down. Yeah, and it, uh, level 10s are shortly on the horizon here. With both these towers going down, they'll be right on the door of level 10 uh, for Region Phoenix, that is. And we'll have to see how they want to double down. Are they going to go into more aggression? Are they going to... Uh, what kind of ults are going to be picked up is a real important question. We don't have the immediate second turn in available from the side of Region, but they're very close to it. Yeah, they do need just six more, so two sets of three here, uh, which they can pick up in the top two lanes. Yep. You're so much better at caster math than I am. I, I'm i trained in the art of caster math. I, I dare not. We do see now one gem away. Should be getting picked up by Arrow right there. Although we do have a decent sized push in the bottom lane. We have actually a really interesting kind of ballsy play maybe coming out from the side of region. We've got Rabbit Penguin put very forward, and they are still up heroics. Darabo drops the portal. The rest of his team hasn't quite gotten in yet. There it is. There it goes, the engagement before the level 10s come out, and that is going to be the immediate blow up out onto Darth Uther, followed very shortly thereafter by Gul'dan. Truffle Shuff is able to get away, but that is the successful camp invade and steal from Regen Phoenix. Yeah, really nice invade. Picked the right timing just before 10s came out and created basically an impossible zone to fight on on the button. Uh, but on the good side for Chaos of the Waking Dragon, they do can, uh, still have all the gems necessary for a turn-in, so they didn't lose those, uh, which would be the real snowball. But it does open the window for Region Phoenix to go ahead and get this turn-in taken care of and drop the second Web Weavers on two keeps already. Two keep walls here at the seven minute mark. Two keep walls, and those lanes are still really pushed out towards those keeps as well, so it's not like they've got a nice little bank of minions that they can try to defend with. And bottom fort looks like it's going to go down even before the uh, web weavers fall. Sheath positioned uh, really aggressively, shall we say. We do see regen back out just a little bit, looking to try and abuse those portals to see if they can find a more advantageous engagement. 
She's finding a bit of engagement on that Rabbit Penguin, who gets the follow-up stun from Dark Uther with the follow-up stun with himself, doing a lot of damage. However, Rabbit Penguin is still the first one to fall. Silent Shoe is very low as well, but this does look like it's getting turned around by Regen Phoenix. They did lose the first kill, but they find the next two and probably another one beyond that in Sheep. Where is the time CC'd enemy? That, uh, as combustion goes out, actually, the chase continues, and four, possibly five, depending on the dank body blocks from Arrow, not dank enough, unfortunately, with follow-up available. Uh, but I want to look, Control-8 opens here, time CC to enemy, and I don't think Medivh has CC outside of Polymorph, right? No, I don't believe so. That's 25 seconds of sheep time that occurred in that fight. That is an absurd amount of polymorph value that was uh, that really turned the fight around for Regen Phoenix after the first kills picked up on a rabid penguin. So actually insane as bottom keep is in uh, dire straits here. While true, laughing and jet propulsion. Mudge actually true. goes in for the very aggressive 1v3, finds the kill out onto Shu and is pushing really aggressively into Truffle Shuff. They are trying to find another kill. They might look to end here if they can find another one. They are likely to find another one as she finds himself on the wrong side of that engagement. We do have the Ultralisk, which we've yet to comment on, coming out and doing a little bit of stunning into Sheep. We do have the pushback going out and moving Dark Luther from the team fight as we have so Johanna's the next person to fall, and we have now the five-person team white coming out from the side of Regen Phoenix, and that is going to be the very quick and aggressive game number one going out in favor of Regen Phoenix. Yeah, faster than a kill a minute. Uh, there is very little that uh, Chaos of the Waking Dragon can do as Silent Shoe gets body blocked from his own Hall of Storms. Middle Keep goes down, but it's all just XP on the table as Regen Phoenix takes game one in dominant fashion. Very dominant indeed. That was... I'm sure Murdo was happy to see that game. There's a couple region folks in uh, in the chat there that I'm sure are quite enjoying that game. That was a that was a good game. That was a good game. So checking out this here summary screen right now. This is why sometimes that those admittedly awesome bits of stats that get dropped, I believe, by Key can be a little bit misleading. This game was extremely dominant from the side of Regen Phoenix, but their numbers aren't particularly high. Like, it was an incredibly short game, 10 minutes, 13 seconds. So that's, you know, that 33,000 coming out from Medivh is impressive for the time, but we don't get stats for time. We just get overall stats. I believe keys are adjusted per minute, or rather, is it per minute or per game? I know, like, your healing numbers are like 70,000, so I assume it's per game. So yeah, you're I believe you're so. right. Yeah, it's not necessarily cumulative, as in the number of games doesn't matter, but rather the quantity in the game does matter. But yeah, totally agree that sometimes in the middle of the curve you actually see the highest numbers. Looking at you know us as an example, but also uh, you just don't have the most dominant games, but you don't just get stomped over and over. So. It leads to those drawn-out games where the scaling matters more. Recyclic, how many different million-dollar bets do you have with Murda on a weekly basis? I'm genuinely interested. And how many millions of dollars do you owe each other? Does it cancel out yet? Have confirmation from Silent Shoe that they are going to be opting for first pick once again. Still waiting to hear from Regen on what they're going to want to go for map number two. Yeah. So, let's let's theorize a little bit. If, if you're going up against Regen Phoenix as uh, Chaos of the Waking Dragon, what do you do from here? Like... Well, let's check see what they have done in the past that's a good call and we'll we'll definitely need to wait for the map you said they deferred map yes or map. preferred for... all right all right we have confirmation from area we're going to be going to alterac pass for game number two cool cool
So, not a lot of team to th theorize what they might have done as far as map pick uh, goes in general. They did opt for first pick, but we are on Alterac Pass. How do you think this map is going to look compared to the previous one for our two teams? Well, it, the objective works a lot the same. Control the area get uh, for admittedly a different amount of time and in a different mechanic. But the, the reward of the objective is relatively similar. Push the three lanes, split people up, prefer one lane maybe if you want to get a boss win condition open, etc. And then go from there. So I think there are a couple pocket picks that could work out well for Chaos of the Waking Dragon, but I'm looking through their hero roster and maybe they'll pull some out i'm not entirely sure you do have two games of tassadar that would be neat i love a tassadar i'm not sure that i'd want to see it here it, i don't think it's probably a especially not. good map for him no probably not uh they pick Greymane a lot i think Greymane I think isn't Greymane would be a particularly decent. i think it'd be a pretty good pick it gives you that i need that uh, partial soul laner that I think is really good on this map. That's true. And That's true. It gives you really good camp control, and the camps are very strong on this map. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I, I definitely can see that. He does provide that cl uh, camp clear, and I'm sure it's a comfort pick for uh, chaos. So, no, that's not. It's not a bad choice. Uh, what else? We do have. Do, do, do. Li Ming. I particularly like long range poke heroes on this map, but that's just my preference because I like being able to stall the objective and draw it out for a long time and then eventually capitalize on the positioning of the enemies. Yeah, I know you do. You prefer to play Chromie on this map in a lot of cases. I do, and that's when you don't get to play Maya. That is true. Uh, Chromie is good because you can sit behind the wall and then just poke repetitively. And as long as there's no... If the mid-fort's up, they can't capture the objective, period. Which can give your team time to uh, to farm up a level, to play it slowly, uh, for the enemy team to make a mistake. Uh, something like that. Or just slow play a fight and just chunk out superior poke damage. I do know so, that in days gone past, that Junkrat was actually really popular for yes. a very similar reason. Yes, yeah, so it's the same principle. Uh, and but it, I think yeah. Junkrat is even more of a meta pick right now than Chromie is, so I wouldn't be super mm -hmm. surprised to see it. I don't know if either yeah. of the teams have a history of playing Junkrat, but I would like to see it. We are now going into game number two, we just started the drafting phase. Uh, there's the Respect mm -hmm. Medivh band coming out from the side of Chaos the Waking Dragon. Not a particularly big surprise. Darabo put in a ton of work in that game. Isn't so. this the second time we've seen Darabo and Region Phoenix go like completely ham with a uh, the other time Medivh believe, comp? Yeah, it was on Towers of Doom, I'm pretty sure. Yes, it was, uh, yeah. And it was heading into the Zuljan Distillery yes. finals, I believe. It was the semifinals on their side of the bracket. It was nasty, so... Yeah. Good ban coming out from them. Garrosh? Yeah. I don't know that Regen plays a ton of Garrosh. That might just be a comfort ban coming out from them. Tend to agree. I don't think Arrow plays a lot of Garrosh, but... I don't think we saw a Deathwing pick or ban last game. That is accurate. That is actually accurate. I'm pretty sure Deathwing made it the entire way through without being mentioned even. I would like to see a Deathwing. I'm not going to argue. Waking Dragon would wake a dragon and has played him once, so I'm not going to argue it at all. Please. Have Regen play Deathwing. Uh, let me find which Regen logo they are. Uh, nope, it's the other pinkish colored one. They are neutral Regen globe colored. Okay, uh, they have not played Deathwing. <laughs> All right, we do have the first pick, Johanna, coming out once again. Still a very strong standard pick. She's not a Deathwing, but, you know, she's she's pretty good. 
Yeah, there there's it a is. Deathwing. That's one Deathwing. That's Golden Deathwing too. That's very nice looking. Yeah, you can. Uh, that means that they had at one point gotten three Deathwings, and now it's got the power of the two base Deathwings combined. <laughs> <laughs> and all the buffs on top, which unfortunately can be none. Yeah, so it's just uh, it's just a double strength Deathwing. Yeah, uh, a series of Hearthstone Battlegrounds jokes for you out there. Man, how, how many the, times uh, are we gonna bring that up? Coming out from Mudge, probably just many... the, probably just once per cast, I think. Yeah, but we also bring it up in Starcraft and a whole bunch of other games. So, I... Hearthstone Battlegrounds and triples. I tell you what, it's true. Blessing upon friends. So. One of the cool things about Region Phoenix's uh, roster is that Mudge and Arrow both are practice main tanks. Arrow mainly with Blaze, but they can swap off main tank and off tank duties pretty effectively and still uh, be just as potent either way. So that gives them a lot of draft flexibility. So, coming, yeah, pretty good. Coming up from Chaos the Waking Dragon, we have Leoric and Lucio. I think Leoric is one of the best Deathwing counters, not only because of... You know, the Drain Hope, which is obviously very effective because it's percent damage. But also, Entomb is one of the only ways that you can, like, slow down a Deathwing. Because it provides, you know, actually unpathable terrain. And Lucio's pretty decent as well. He, one of the things that can really help against a Deathwing is mobility, and Lucio provides that to his whole team. So, I think it's an, a workable pick. Zeratul is a very scary hero coming off from Darabo as well definitely definitely can win games basically solo handed and I Jaina is like the God. world's most natural pair with Zeratul wow Illidan and Karazim on top of this this is I did not expect that and again it's one damage dealer from Chaos of the Waking Dragon right. uh, talk me through this one Ace I get Karazim because seven sided yeah. and Deathwing right why Illidan camps i i'm i'm as confused as you are to be quite honest alex pickup is the only way to actually support deathwing also but more dragons let's go more dragon yeah that's more dragons is better than less dragons uh the, the illidan pick is really i don't know to me. i don't know what that does for them it I mean, it doesn't work with Johanna because jo i mean Johanna can walk in on a hunt target afterwards and provide a follow-up and Leo can entomb it, but again, you just don't have damage. Like, what are you gonna do is damage when you can just drop a heal circle, drop an Alex Q. There's just there's no burst damage in the comp of Chaos of the Waking Dragon. They do have functional sustain damage, and I think it's better sustain damage, but they have to live that. So I think the best thing they can hope for is a long drawn out fight where they get huge value out of their support ultimates and then win as it goes on yeah we'll have to wait and see we do have now spawning in the blue trunks on the left hand side we have chaos of the waking dragon with truffle shuff playing lucio silent shoe is playing the illidan don ron for life playing the johanna we have darth karazim and we have sheath playing the leoric and in the red trunks on the right side of the map, we have Arrow standing tall on Deathwing, Rabid Penguin on Jaina, Arya on Alex Straza, Mudge on the Dibbles, and Darbo playing Zeratul. It is Region Phoenix. So the one thing that I think could go decently well for the side of Cast the Waking Dragon is if they find an isolated target, they can kill the heck out of mm -hmm. it. You know, Hunt seven-sided strike is basically going to make anything die, even a Deathwing by itself. So if they can find those isolated picks, then you know they'd be down a couple of volts, but they'd be up a hero of five v four. So that could maybe be how they're looking to take these fights as well. Yeah, I mean the team fight con win cons seem somewhat clear. Region Phoenix wins with the Void Apoc Ring combo that should just kill anybody that exists, not even including Deathwing's damage there. And uh, Chaos wins drawn out fights. So it's on Chaos not to get blown up in these fights, and it's on Darabo to make the good void happen. And uh, I think the burden of execution is harder on Chaos, so I'll have to see how they do it. We do have a, a fairly interesting lane arrangement with Mudge actually taking the solo top lane on Diablo. 
he kind of can't step into this. I mean, there are obviously three up here, so he'd have a hard time doing anything anyhow. But I think he'd even have a hard time against just solo Illidan, to be honest. Yeah, he does, and he used his uh, flip over a little bit early. Arrow is so... dancing in the mid lane on Deathwing. It's really adorable, as the rest of his uh, <laughs> mid lane compatriots have gone to the uh, the null camp, so they can try to take that nice and early. We do have the very early uh, camp disparity coming out favoring regen in that regard, as we still have three members in the top lane not looking to go take their own null camp just yet. Yep, they're uh, opting to push for a little while, and that, that is the problem. There goes Karazim. Over the wall, he can dash out. Oh, he, he does not dash out. There he, we go. He dashed to Illidan, but Illidan was too close to the wall, so he didn't actually get over the wall. Yep. <laughs> Weird little uh, interaction. Sheath actually taking a bunch of damage. It's going to pop the Wraithwalk and survive, but it does seed a lot of position to Regen Phoenix with the Null Camp, and there's not a lot of camp clear here. Leo does okay, uh, and much better once he gets four, uh, assuming he picks up Neil Peasants. But that is already first tower down uh, for Regen Phoenix. So this is kind of the thing I was worried about for Chaos of the Waking Dragon is Deathwing on that floor with that uh, AoE damage every time he lands that W in Worldbreaker form, I think. Forms are hard. But, uh, no, sorry, Destroyer form. But everyone on, on the side of Chaos of the Waking Dragon, except for Lucio, is melee, and that's just going to be a lot of ticking damage that Arrow's going to be able to chunk out over time, and he'll be able to get those big Ws to keep himself really well topped off as well. Yeah, that is a uh, important point. Another important point is that Diablo actually got killed in the top lane, so Race to Seven is currently being won by Chaos of the Waking Dragon. A little bit of overaggression by Mudge. I saw a Silent Shoe lived with about 500 or so health. So, yeah. Uh, nice job there by Silent Shoe to confirm the kill while Mudge was by himself. We have both teams now looking to try and take their own null camps. This is obviously going to favor regen as they already took one earlier. Um, I am also quite surprised to see Transcendence coming out from the Karazim and not Iron Fists. Yeah, I mean, if you treat it in the context that a sustained fight goes their way and they win, you can justify the pick. But adding a little bit of extra damage isn't bad. Sheath going to be taking a little bit of extra damage does start wraith walking away has about 400 health but an amp it up and a boop will get him out of there but he's gonna have to go tap possibly or just be pushed out of the fight as region phoenix is gonna unlock the camp first and it does look like they're mostly opting to seed point uh control over to the side of region because they still have illidan in the top lane trying to do some damage instead they want to make this team fight go on as long as they can without region actually getting the objective and arrows low enough that they might be able to do that they do Looked like they're going to flip it back over. Trushoff was able to get the channel. Really good body blocks actually coming out from Ron for life. Mudge actually in a really bad spot. Incredible body blocking comes out. He does find a disengage through Sheath, but that is going to be him going down as the second kill of the game, as well as the first. And Illidan was pushing the top lane the whole time. He's got the entire top wall down. Darabo actually probably going to have a bit of a hard time 1v1ing an Illidan, especially under minions where he can do the auto attacking. And that's subjective control going out in favor of Cast the Waking Dragon. Yeah, it's it's a good job note uh, for certain for uh, Chaos of the Waking Dragon. Uh, and they need to get as many advantages as they can pre-level 10, because level 10 is where the Wombo Combo comes online. So they need to try and secure this objective pre-10 uh, if they can. Uh, and since Illidan was pushing top the whole time, they have the chance to do that. Arrow takes a lot of damage from the Drain Hope and is going to pop that uh, Wing Flap. That'll keep him just sustained up over 20 armor right now. Alex Straza Dragon Form is out with the Double Dragon action. Uh, but it seems like Chaos of the Waking Dragon is taking a lot of damage. Darth is pushed out of this fight for a little while. Uh, Sheath, or Sheath does, in fact, uh, escape with the Wraith Walk. And it is going to be a temporary cease to the fighting as Regent Phoenix looks to invade. And we did have Silent Shoe win the 1v1 versus Darabo in the top lane. He's just going to continue and probably push down that fort all by himself. Yeah, he can do that or he can turn this into a 4v5. Uh, it is their choice and there are a few wrong choices as long as you know, something good does end up happening. Lucio grabs the camp and that's going to be it 
first objective on the side of Chaos of the Waking Dragon. My mind's being blown right now. I can't believe that this is working like this. Yeah. I'm kind of surprised as well. Uh, and there's that <laughs> you fort. Know, sure enough, just enough. Winions grab the fort. Silent Shoe disengages with his life. And uh, Deathwing landing into possibly the middle of Chaos does end up walking out. But that's level 10's picked up for this objective phase for Chaos of the Waking Dragon. They need to make the most of this in a major way. Yeah, they need to find themselves actually an even larger advantage than they already have, just because of how strong the blow potential is from the side of regen. We see the bottom objective has already been taken down completely. It took them about four seconds to do that. Imagine what they can do to your team. <laughs> yeah, those, uh, those minions, the cavalry, have almost 9,000 health currently, and the average has about a third of that right now on, uh, on the side of chaos, so they've got to be careful. The full combo is online. Do they have which up is that? That is bellowing roar. So there is CC on top of CC ultimate. So this is a major wombo combo that is going to be on Lucio to barrier if it happens, or on the whole team to avoid. Well, well so much for the avoidance. Here is the start of the combo, and oh, that's so much damage. That is a really good beat drop. It is actually probably going to save a couple of them. Silent Shoot gets brought down very low. It's probably going to be secured by the dragons. Actually manages to get out. Sheath hasn't been taken down either. That was the whole blow-up combo, and nobody died. Well? That was, uh, well, we got we got the good barrier from Lucio. Absorbed Beat all the damage. It's a good unit. Oh, it is an amazing, amazing ability. It is, may I say, the best... Uh, burst prevention ult that doesn't just totally make the target immune. I oh, wow. think it... Without giving protected yeah. or immune, I think it's the best burst prevention in the game. And he showed it right there, and with the kerosene, even though he didn't go into palm, the damage did force uh, a lot of regen phoenix to kind of take second thoughts after the fight started to break down a little bit, so... Nice job there, is that uh, Chaos now looks at the boss. Mudge and the group of region Phoenicians do pick up the kill on Sheath, but they haven't. They just now spot the boss, but it is too low for them to do anything with no ults. Mudge takes seven kicks to the face, and they're going to try and engage this. He does get a nice heal, but the boss is picked up for Chaos of the Waking Dragon. His arrow lands uh, post-fight, and the disengage occurs with no further deaths. Don't worry, Chaos. Nobody saw that four-person boss stun at the start of that boss engage. We do have the objective coming up now in the top lane. Boss is going to push in the bottom lane, and it looks like regen are really going to have to seed position on the first objective so that they can clear this without losing their bottom fort. So that could give time for Chaos the Waking Dragon to start the channel, or they could go in on mid-fort. It looks like they're opting to go for the objective, as we have Darabo doing what they can trying to take this camp. It is going to be kind of slow, and they're actually taking a lot of damage for it, so they'll have to probably go back, if not... I don't even know if he can actually finish this camp by himself without help. It's very close. We do have area here just in time to make sure that that happens without the reset. But that's the start of the objective coming out, and... gets immediately turned back over by minions. Uh, so... Ooh. A lot of good things are actually coming out from the side of Castle Lake and Dragon in this game, but there's a couple of small things that are kind of holding them back from really snowballing their position in this game. Yeah. Uh, point of note here, Donron does not have a lot of health or mana in this fight, and Darth does not have a lot of health. Nice job by Lucio to hold the barrier. Did not channel the barrier before the Void came out, so the uh, barrier comes out a little bit late, and Johanna is blown up almost instantly. Silent Shoot also goes down immediately afterwards, and that is two kills in the blow-up combo for Regen Phoenix. Uh, make that three as Sheath's gonna get taken out in top. Is it level 16 that Leo gets a uh, damage reduction on his E? Or is that no, a... that is 13. That, that is, is 13, 13 so he's opted for have... unyielding there. Yeah, uh, opting not to go into that huge damage cut, which can really do a significant amount of burst prevention when that's exactly what Regen Phoenix is looking to do, is just burst your team from 100 to 0. Uh, I am I totally agree, because I was thinking, like, oh yeah, he can go Crushing Ope or even Spectral Leech for that lifesteal on Diablo or 
Deathwing to chunk them down. But never mind, they're going to re-engage. Nice march is actually going to top Sheath all the way up. Seven Side Strike makes Darth immune for just a second. But the camp is taken, and so this will be a disengage call as Illidan was on the bottom camp the entire time. If Illidan were there, I still don't think that he could actually... Agree. ...change things, so being on that camp maybe is actually the right call for Silent Shoot. Agree. Hard agree. So, yeah. Going back to the Leoric 13, I totally think you're right with the, uh... With the damage reduction, although the percent damage is good and definitely isn't bad, I don't think it's what they need in their comp. Uh, Cataclysm over the four is gonna uh, be okay for now as minions show up. Here comes the void out, the ring and the a pot come out. It only hits Silent Shoe and a nice bearer comes out, but the even the two thousand something health bearer that comes out is not enough to save uh, Silent Shoe in that case, and it looks like the snowball. Once this combo gets online from Regen Phoenix, is starting to happen. Well, plus, since the first uh, attempt at the combo, Jaina did finish out that Fingers of Frost, so she's got that extra frost damage that's allowing these combos to give just that little bit of extra damage to finish out over the top of Lucio's speed drop. Yeah, Lucio grants a 2300 point shield, and it just got ripped right through, so there's a lot of damage happening. A. Uh, Cleansing Flame comes out from Alex Straza. Don't know if that was unintended or just maybe prevention of some kind of mistake that uh, Arya saw, but nonetheless, uh, that ult is down. Silent Shoe goes in and goes out really quick, makes a fast exit. Darth goes in, also going to take a rapid exit, and it looks like the staggered fights are uh, definitely going in favor of Region Phoenix. So that was... That seven-sided strike is exactly why I said that I think they need to try and find isolated picks, because you know, he kicks four different people two times each and does very little effective damage to them overall. So, not a great team fight ult unless you can really focus on splitting out your opponents. We do see regen probably just running immediately to that top boss, as there's three people dead on the side of Castle Waking Dragon, and they can see Sheath in the bottom lane, and they saw Johanna in the mid lane, and there's really nothing that they can actually do about this boss. Yep, and the bottom boss is available in a matter of seconds, so they will be able to make a boss-to-boss -boss play if they desire, or just uh, push with this one, try and get kills with it. So it is up to Regen Phoenix as to what they want to do. Bottom boss is actually being just now started by Chaos of the Waking Dragon. I don't know how good their damage is to get three-man stunned on the boss. That does not help you clear it very quickly unless you're Uther. Big facts. We did see Regen immediately heading to the bottom, but looks like they've changed their mind. They just want to try and get that top keep, and with as slow as Chaos are to actually spawn into this, this keep is going to fall with basically no damage done to the boss. They might even look to push in with this full health boss, try and get a kill, and win the game off of it. Yeah, the wind con's open now, as the core only has 20% uh, armor, and why not? You know why not at least give this a shot? As Regen Phoenix, you have your combo up in case you want to uh, try and make something special happen. Darebo goes in, gets the three-man void. Here comes Apoc, here comes the ring. Good barrier comes out, but it's might not be enough. Donron and Darth both get taken out. Combo is successful. Regen Phoenix uh, up two members in the fight. Silent Shoe gonna get taken out. Trades out the life for Arrow as she ends up picking that kill, I believe, at the Crushing Hope on 16. But the most important kill, the core, is taken out with the boss, and that's a fast 2-0 for Regen Phoenix. GG's and well played. And I gotta say, I'm really glad at how much better, honestly, that this game looked for Chaos the Waking Dragon than the first game did. They really did show some very serious signs of life. They were doing some things really well. Genuinely surprised me during that first objective that they were able to take while also taking a top four, but just kind of giving away their their advantage over time as uh, the kill combo came online for the side of region. Yeah, um... What was it? The game started out 3-0 in kills and finished out with the last... Uh, 12 of 13 going to Regen Phoenix. So that was uh, the kill combo did work every single time after 
the first, and I believe the first was only because uh, A, Arrow was in the fight, but B, there's an amazing barrier from Truffle Chef that got, got maximum, maximum value, uh, and before even more power was gained. So, yep, there's it's been tough for Chaos this whole season, and uh, hope they'll stick together and uh, plow forward. I think they've got they've got They've got good ideas, just need to refine them a little bit, I would yeah. say. If they played as well during the whole season as they did in game number two, I would be surprised if they didn't pick up a couple more wins before the season's over. But yeah, we do it's... have Area. We're going to be meeting for an interview already in the coin toss lobby, so we're going to hop over there. All right, let's do it. Congratulations, Area, on your very dominating 2-0 domination over Chaos the Waking Dragon. Thank you. Thank you guys for casting. Yeah, absolutely. We, uh, we'll never catch up to Arrow, but, you know, when the headcaster says, hey, maybe you should cast this game, it's hard to say no. <laughs> it can be persuasive like that. Yeah. I mean, look, look, if we even count both of ours, both, like, Ekar and my total together, I don't think we could ever catch them, even in our entire career. That guy's insane. Yeah. Alrighty, so you guys had a map pick going into game number one. You chose Tomb of the Spider Queen. What is the reasoning behind that decision? Sharing is caring. We wanted to play uh, some different maps tonight, and Spider Queen um, was something that we knew Chaos enjoys playing, so we thought we'd take them to their home. It's a really interesting uh, decision. Uh, I don't know that I've ever taken my opponents to a map that I know that they feel comfortable on unless I also feel really comfortable on that map. We feel pretty good this season with the uh, map pool that's available. I definitely feel comfortable everywhere. So in the end, map pick is a minor decision in our thought process. That's fair. So just as comfortable on Braxis Holdout as you are on Sky Temple. Interesting. Absolutely. Uh, so looking over at your team's composition, it was mostly a pretty standard blow-up comp, but really the, the X factor, it felt like from our end, was the Medivh. You were pretty low on general wave clear, but the fact that you were able to use those portals to literally go from mid lane to top lane without any travel time made up for your somewhat lacking wave clear, but it also exponentially increased your kill pressure, and it really showed at the end of that game as Mediv was kind of just securing all of the team's kills. Uh, is that, uh... Is, you say that's an accurate assessment of that game? You know, Mediv is one of the heroes that changes how you play the game. It also changes how your opponent has to play against you. And it takes a lot of faith and a lot of trust in the person playing the Mediv with those portals. If you've ever clicked a bad portal, you understand how easily it can get you killed. So we have absolute faith in Derry, and when he drops the portal, we're going to go. Right. So I'm curious. Who... I, I would assume Darebo's not your main shot caller. I believe that's Arrow. Uh, that's incorrect. Uh, who, who calls most of the like engagement shots? We actually have a group call strategy. Nice. We are all per perfectly capable of shot calling, and we all are very good at our jobs, so we all shot call. That's fair enough. But is Darabo just suddenly going, portal, portal, go kill the somebody? Or, or is no. there just a portal up here, and y'all just kind of walk through it? The portal appears, and you go through it like it's... <laughs> fair enough. We did definitely see that during the engagement on the... Uh the invade for your opponent's bruisers where Darabo is just kind of sitting above it for a long time and Rabbit was kind of the only one within portal distance but that portal went down and Rabbit went through a couple of seconds later the rest of the team showed up and made a huge wipe of everything but there was a lot of faith coming up from uh, Rabbit there as they just kind of went blindly through a portal like that that's what teamwork will do for you alrighty Ace anything else about uh, game number one not a lot more to be said, to be honest. Alrighty. Uh, so going into game number two, I had heard uh, from my co-caster, actually, that 
Mudge and Arrow will actually swap roles with one person taking the off lane and the other taking main tank, depending on what the team is looking for. Is that something that you do frequently? It is, absolutely. Um, depending on what anybody's feeling that night, um, we have the ability, most of us, to play any role, and they're both very comfortable swapping. Very cool. Uh, so, game number one went basically in your team's favor from the moment it started it until the very last hit point of the core went down. Game number two was a lot closer, especially in the early game. How how were you guys feeling trying to position around that first objective fight where Illidan was actually split pushing the whole time, actually took a 1v1 against Darabo, and you also ended up losing in the 4-4 four, four four fight? How, how were you looking to get back in the game at that point? Illidan did a great job split pushing. Uh, in hindsight, I feel that we should have changed the solo laner um, from our side to compensate, and we didn't catch that early enough, and therefore we paid the price, and they played very well early game, so kudos. <laughs> Mudge says that Darabo doesn't speak in game. That is mostly true. Accurate statement. <laughs> I, I, as... We played with Darbo, I believe is NGS one. That is an accurate statement. I'm just wondering if he like I know we heard him a couple of times when we've seen a region Phoenix Vada. I was just curious how the portal comms went. But no, he's just the silent killer. Gary speaks when it's important and uh, we love him for it. Alright, so for the most part after Jaina finished out her level 1 quest and you guys hit heroics, you pretty much won most of the team fights after that, so I don't know that I have much left for game number uh, 2, but looking ahead for the rest of your season, are there any matches that you're really looking forward to, any teams you're looking forward to or potentially a little bit nervous about? Um, we are looking forward to Jailbait. That's a team that we've played before. And then I know we're also prepping something special for Tiny Dancers. So maybe you'd like to cast us again. I would always like to cast you guys again. You have very entertaining games. Uh, and I think we've got a pretty decent rapport between our two teams. Absolutely. It also gives me the opportunity to make a multitude of Elton John puns. So... I can't argue with that. I look forward to uh, listening to the VOD to hear them. <laughs> All right. Ace, you got anything else? Uh, nothing much. Uh, GG's well played, and good luck. Hope to see you on the other side of the B bracket. Smile. Bring your A game to the B. Whoa. It's deep. I, don't know. I, I definitely like me a good language pun, so I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, stream. I don't want to necessarily say don't go anywhere because the stream is in fact about to change. I do not do multi-match uh, casted streams the way uh, Arrow or Bahamut Gaming are want to do because those men are crazy. But Amazing, yeah. but crazy. But we do actually have a Lurk Patrol scrim game coming up actually against Regen Phoenix, so... If you liked what they were doing and want to see a Medivh get banned out every game, stick around, as uh, here in just a couple of minutes we're probably going to be having uh, those scrims started. Every game? That's so low. <laughs> I know, we'll leave them up for the uh, Haunted Minds game so you can't portal into the basement. One of my favorite maps. You're breaking my heart right now. <laughs> We actually oh, ended boy. up playing that in XGDI, and it was not fun, I believe, for our opponents. Uh, it was a very dominating game on our side, but for the, I don't think anyone in our team even entered the mines. We literally just no. four push bot, one push top the whole game until it ended. Yep. And occasionally going back for Merc camps and then pushing again. We had like 17 Merc camps by the end of that game. It was ridiculous. Yeah. I actually wouldn't even hate that as a as a map. No objective, just all Merc camps. Isn't that Cursed Hollow, basically? Eh, kinda. 
All right. All right. Thank you for well, thanks for joining for us. Interview. Uh, Thank you everyone for watching. Yeah. Uh, the stream is going to go down for just a little bit as we get started up for the scrims that we have coming up, but it'll be uh, right back up shortly thereafter. So don't stick around, but, you know, come back. <laughs>